Good evening. This is the evening service of the North Preston Evangelical Church. And if you are not part of our church family and are joining us for this service, we very warmly welcome you in the Saviour's name. As I mentioned this morning, we hope this will be our final Sunday apart. We're not absolutely sure yet. We're still waiting for further clarification and we'll be in touch about that. Please continue to make that a matter of prayer. But here we are this evening, again, a scattered church, but nevertheless in the presence of the one in whom we find our oneness, our Lord Jesus Christ. He was with us this morning. We thank him for his word and for his blessing. And we look to him now for his help and blessing as we come to this evening out of worship. I want to begin with some words of the Lord Jesus, some of his best known words of all, the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, reading from verse 3 to verse 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray together. Gracious and almighty God, we thank you for what you are doing all around the world in transforming grace, taking the proud and self-sufficient and making them poor in spirit, Jesus, all their hope, all their righteousness. Taking those who are careless about their sin and unconcerned for the honour of God and making them spiritual mourners, grieving over their own sins, zealous, burdened for the glory of God in the world. Taking those whose hunger and thirst is for the things of the world and making them to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Making men merciful and meek and pure in heart and peacemakers and making them willing to suffer all manner of things for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how immeasurably the richer we are if that transforming grace is part of our experience and you have made us to be the kind of people described in these beatitudes, all these blessings that are ours now and shall be ours as you bring your purposes in grace to fulfilment. It's ours, the kingdom of heaven, promise of being comforted, promise of satisfaction, of inheriting the earth, of seeing God, the great rewards and store for those who willingly suffer for Jesus' sake. Almighty God, we pray that you will begin that transforming work in 
many another heart. Let that be one of the fruits of the witness of your people, the proclamation of the gospel throughout the world this day. And we ask, Lord, that in those in whose hearts you have begun this good work, you will be pleased to carry it on. We pray that you will make our very time together this evening part of that. Grant that through the hymns and the psalm and the reading of scripture and the preaching of your word, we who are yours would make progress spiritually, would grow in our faith and in our understanding and our likeness to our Lord Jesus Christ. And that that we pray for ourselves, we pray for your people throughout the world. Thank you for those who are able to gather as congregations. Remember those who are still having to meet in their home. We pray that wherever your people are, you would be there in power to bless and at work not only in their hearts, but in the hearts of men and women, boys and girls, still strangers to, their, to your grace, that they may be strangers no longer, a part of the body of Christ, part of the family of God, numbered among those many brothers of whom Christ is the firstborn. Hear us, so gracious God, as we pray and as we commit this hour into your hands, we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. I want to read a metrical psalm. This is Psalm 138. It would be delightful to unite our hearts and voices in the singing of this psalm, but the Lord bless the reading of it. Psalm 138. It's a psalm of praise. I praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods I'll sing your praise. I'll bow towards your holy place and bless your holy name always. I praise you for your faithfulness and for your covenant love, O Lord. For over all things you have raised your holy name and faithful word. The very day I called to you, you gave an answer to my plea. You made me bold within myself. With new resolve, you strengthened me. O oh Lord, let all earth's kings give praise. When from your mouth they hear your word, let them extol the ways of God, for great the glory of the Lord. Although the Lord God dwells on high, the lowly person he protects. Whereas the proud and haughty one, he knows afar off and rejects. Although I walk a troubled path, your tender care preserves my life. You raise your hand against my foes. Your right hand saves me from their strife. The Lord will certainly fulfill for me the purpose he commands. Your love endures forever, Lord. Preserve the works of your own hands. Let me invite you to turn in your Bible to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis and to chapter 47, and right at the end of chapter 47. The book of Genesis, chapter 47, right at the end, we pick up the last few verses, reading from verse 29, and then on into chapter 48, and we'll be reading the whole of chapter 48. Genesis 47, reading from verse 29. Jacob has come down with his family into Egypt. He has been there now for 17 years. Verse 29. And when the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, If now I have found favour in your sight, 
Put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. After this, Joseph was told, Behold, your father is ill. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And it was told to Jacob, Your son Joseph has come to you. Then Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me, and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a company of peoples, and will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. And now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are. And the children that you fathered after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. As for me, when I came from Paddan, to my sorrow Rachel died in the land of Canaan on the way, when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, They are my sons, whom God has given me here. And he said, Bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age, so that he could not see. So Joseph brought them near him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face. And behold, God has let me see your offspring also. Then Joseph removed them from his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. And in them let my name be carried on, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not this way, my father, since this one is the firstborn, put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he. And his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce blessings, saying, God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die, but God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you, rather than to your brothers, one mountain slope that I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. 
we have been listening to God's words and we give thanks to him for it and pray for his blessing as we come in a few moments to his exposition. I want to read some verses of a hymn. This is in the praise hymn book, hymn number 543 in praise. I'm going to read these verses and then we're going to pray and then we will move on into the exposition of God's word. Sovereign Lord, we sing your glory. Yours is the eternal throne. Majesty and awesome power flow from God and God alone. Far above the earth's small circle, you embrace infinity, reigning mighty over all things, glorious, holy trinity. Sovereign Lord, show us your glory. Give us eyes to pierce the veil, eyes to see transcendent beauty, God the Lord who cannot fail. Draw us closer by your Spirit till our hearts can bear no more. Gracious, patient, loving, faithful, Lord, your glory we adore. Sovereign Lord, we love your glory. Righteousness and truth we praise. You alone, our God, are worthy to receive the song we raise. Angels sing your matchless grandeur, face to face by glory awed. Gladly we bow down before you and by faith proclaim you Lord. Sovereign Lord, restore your glory. Sovereign Lord, the darkness lift. Take us out to tell the story of our Lord's stupendous gift. Fill our hearts until there blazes holy love to save, to heal. Sovereign Lord, come down in power. Holy glory, now reveal. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Sovereign Lord, we have prayed that the darkness would lift. And what darkness there is over all our land. We see it in every sphere of human existence. We see it among our leaders in the ungodly decisions that they take in their contempt for the life of the unborn, in their anti-Christian thinking and behaviour. We see it in education, in the endeavours to corrupt the thinking of our children from their earliest years and indoctrinate them in things that are so contrary to the word of truth. We see it in social media and the hatred to which it continually gives expression. And sadly, we see the darkness in your church in this land, in the beliefs that it holds and proclaims, in the lifestyle of it, some of its leaders, in its apostasy from the truth and its denial of the gospel. And Lord, we see it in the communities around us, in their indifference to the gospel, in their worship of other gods, in their addiction to idols. So much darkness. And our prayer is that the darkness would lift. Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world. Shine, Jesus, shine. And let the light dispel the darkness. Let it shine into the hearts of our leaders. And let it shine into the hearts of those who are behind our educational policies. And let the light shine in our communities. And let the light shine in the churches that it might be a pure, 
gospel that is heralded from our churches and that those who herald it would be men of pure lives. And we who are your people, Lord, let us reflect that light. Let us live in the light. We are sons of light, and we would live and shine accordingly as we hold forth the word of life, as we live in accordance with your moral law, as we love you, as we open as the flower to the sun, are transformed into the likeness of Jesus as we look every day just a little bit more like him. Lord God, come, we pray, and dispel the darkness. Shine your light, we pray, and not just here in this nation, but all around the world for the eternal praise and honour of our Saviour Jesus. Amen. Please turn back in your Bibles to the book of Genesis and chapter 47. The book of Genesis chapter 47, we continue on this evening in our evening series on the Joseph story, this last section of the book of Genesis from chapter 37 onwards, dominated by the life of Jacob's son Joseph. And it's with Jacob himself that I want to begin this evening. When Jacob came down into Egypt with his family, he was 130 years old. He tells us that himself. Our last two Sunday evenings began with the interview that Jacob had with Pharaoh when he came down into Egypt. In the course of that interview, Pharaoh asked him how old he was, and this was Jacob's reply. The days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. So when Jacob came down into Egypt, that is how old he was. And in chapter 47, verse 28, we read that Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 147 years. Jacob spends the final years of his life in Egypt, and these final years are 17 in number. Now, these details about Jacob are embedded, as we've noted, in the Joseph story. And it's a very striking thing that the Joseph story begins when Joseph is 17 years old. Jacob and his son Joseph are together for the first 17 years of Joseph's life. And then comes the sudden separation. Joseph is sold as a slave and Jacob thinks that he's dead and for more than 20 years they're apart. And then in the kindness of God they are reunited and for 17 years Jacob is able to enjoy being near to his son Joseph once again. Those first 17 years, such a joy because there was no son whom Jacob loved more than Joseph. And now, in the kindness of God, right at the end of his life, another 17 years when he can be close to this most beloved son. Well, the starting point for this evening's message is the opening part of verse 29, where we read that, the time drew near that Israel must die. Jacob is nearing his end. And as he nears his end, there are two things that are very much on his mind. The first is his own burial. And the second is the blessing of 
Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And it is to these two things that we turn our thoughts this evening. First of all, as Jacob nears his end, here's something that's very much on his mind, and that is his own burial. Verses 29 to 31. And when the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, If now I have found favour in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. Jacob doesn't want to be buried in Egypt. He wants to be buried in Canaan. And he makes Joseph swear, solemnly swear, that he will see to it. And later on, Jacob returns to this subject, this time in the presence of all 12 of his sons. Chapter 49 Jacob has been blessing each of them, verse 28, with the blessing suitable to him. Verse 29. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. In the cave that is in the field at Machpelah, to the east of Mamre, in the land of Canaan which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. And then verse 33 tells us that when Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. This is a big thing for Jacob, isn't it? He must be buried with his fathers back in Canaan. And Joseph is made to swear that he will bring it to pass. And right at the end, with his dying breath, the command is laid upon all twelve of his sons. Bury me with my fathers in Canaan. Now, undoubtedly there is a natural aspect to that. Egypt wasn't Jacob's home. He and his family, and we were thinking about this last Sunday evening, had come down into Egypt simply to sojourn, to be temporary residents there. Canaan was Jacob's home. And given that that's where the family burial plot was, how natural that he should wish to be buried there rather than in Egypt where he was a stranger. It's a common thing for people to want to be buried, not someplace distant from their forefathers, their family, but in the family burial plot, in the place where they've known and loved. You may be sure, however, that there is more to this than natural longing. We may think about it as bound up with Jacob's faith. The land of Canaan was the land that God had promised to Jacob as an everlasting possession. And if you go back to chapter 48, you will hear him speaking about that. Verses 3 and 4. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you. And I will make of you a company of peoples and will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. 
Well, that was an early word. And then there comes this later word, and we were hearing this later word a couple of Lord's Day evenings ago, when Jacob set out for Egypt 17 years before this, the Lord appeared to him in Beersheba, and this is what he said to him. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. Egypt is only going to be a temporary residence. This great nation into which God is going to make Jacob is destined to live in Canaan. That is their home. By repeated covenant promise, on one day, they will return there. Look at chapter 48, verse 21. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die, but God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. And later on, Joseph would say the very same thing in connection with his burial. Chapter 50, verse 25, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. Now, it is within the setting of promises and the faith that believed those promises that we are to set this dying request of Jacob. Canaan was the land promised to his grandfather Abraham, to his father Isaac, and to himself. It was the land where his father slept. It was the land to which his descendants would return as God in faithfulness fulfilled his covenant promise. And Jacob wished to be there. Just as Joseph later on, when he came to die, also wished to be carried up when the people left and have Canaan as his resting place. So as you think about Jacob coming to, your, to his end, he's coming to his end with faith very much in operation. Faith that concerned the future for the covenant family. You see it in chapter 49 in his blessing of his 12 sons. You see it in chapter 48 in the blessing of Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And we see it both in chapter 47 and 49 in the instructions that he gave about his burial. Jacob's God is the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God who in faithfulness to his word will carry the people up out of Egypt into their destined home. And in the deep persuasion of that, Jacob gives these instructions, as afterwards Joseph does also. Now the question as we come to ourselves is this, is there anything like this that enters into the faith of the believer in Jesus when he or she comes to the end? And the answer is that there is. For Jacob, there was a personal element to his faith. He tells his 12 sons, I am about to be gathered to my people. He's going to be joining his godly forefathers. And in the full light of New Testament revelation, you know what that personal faith means as far as we are concerned. Departing at death, to be with the people of God who have gone before, and best of all, departing to be with Jesus, which Paul says in Philippians is better by far. But the faith of the dying believer goes beyond that personal element, just as Jacob's faith did. 
The faith of the dying believer embraces the entire covenant family, the whole church of God. Like Jacob, dying believers are looking forward to a return and to a permanent home. Israel is not going to be in Egypt forever. They are going to return to the land of promise, to their promised home. And in that there is a picture of something grander by far that awaits the whole church of God, the whole church of Jesus Christ. We too have a promised home, a home of which Canaan is the type and symbol. And that home is the very earth on which today we find ourselves strangers, sojourners. One day, we're going to return. The church as a whole is going to return, and it's going to return to a renewed world. And here we shall live, and here we shall be at home forever and ever. And it is in that faith that the believer in Jesus comes to an end. I am leaving this world, but one day in the company of the saints, and best of all, in the company of the Saviour, I'm coming back. And I'm coming back to live here forever. How do we know that? Because Jacob's God is our God. The same covenant-making, covenant-keeping God that Jacob knew. God was faithful to his promises to Jacob. And Israel returned. And he did have his resting place in the midst of his people. And he will be no less faithful to the promises that he has made to us. There is a great future ahead for the church, the whole covenant family. And in that faith, we may go to our graves. In that faith, we may take leave of this world confidently because Christ has triumphed. We, in the company of all the saints, Old and New Testament alike, and in the company of Jesus our Lord, we will come back here and we will take up permanent residence in the home that he has prepared for us. So there's the first thing. As Jacob nears his end, his own burial is very much on his mind, but there's a second thing that's very much on his mind, and that is the blessing of Joseph's sons. Joseph is told that his father is ill, comes to visit him, bringing with him his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. The narrative of that visit, what fills the entirety of chapter 48, Jacob is anxious to bless these boys, and it's around the blessing that we're going to gather our thoughts as we explore this, and this will take us through the rest of the message. And we begin by noting, who is to receive this blessing? And who is to receive this blessing? It's the two boys whom Jacob takes here for his own. Verses 3 to 6. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you and I will make of you a company of peoples and will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. And now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are, 
and the children that you fathered after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. Joseph's two sons are to receive their grandfather's blessing. And they do so. But before that happens, something quite remarkable is done. Jacob makes them his own. He adopts them as his own sons. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, he says, as Reuben and Simeon are. Now, there's a statement later on in the Old Testament which throws a flood of light on this. This is First Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Reuben, says the chronicler, was the firstborn. But because he f defiled his father's couch, as a reference to Reuben's incense, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. Though Judah became strong among his brothers and a chief came from him, a reference to David, yet the birthright belonged to Joseph. And that is what is happening here in Genesis 48. The blessing of the birthright is being given to Joseph. Joseph is taking Reuben's place as Jacob's firstborn. And that meant, for this is how it was with the firstborn, that meant a double portion of the inheritance. And here's what that double portion was. Joseph's two sons. And each is given the status of a son of Jacob, a son of Israel. Each, therefore, is going to become a tribe of Israel in his own right. And when they come to inherit the land, each of them is going to possess his own portion of the land. Fast forward to the days of Joshua. The land of Canaan has been conquered. And it's all being divided up. And this is Judah's lot. And this is Benjamin's lot. And this is Simeon's lot. And this is Reuben's lot. What happens when it comes to Joseph? Two lots. One for Ephraim and one for Manasseh. Now, you stand back from that a little and just see what's happening. Had Joseph's brothers had their way, Joseph would have had none of the inheritance. He was gone. Sold as a slave probably dead. But instead of having none of the inheritance, Joseph comes eventually through his two sons to have a double portion. Two parts of the land. Ephraim's lot. Manasseh's lot. Take it as a picture of something that God often does. Blessing his suffering people in ways that far exceed what they have suffered and lost. Joseph suffers cruelly at the hands of his brothers. How does God make it up to him, if we may so speak, by making him into two tribes, two great branches? of the future family with two significant portions of the land falling to his lot. I think of Jesus' words in Luke 18 to those who have left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God and often that leaving painful and costly. How they will receive many times more in this time and in the age to come, eternal life. Or we go back to the eighth beatitude. We heard it at the outset of the service. 
Why are those who are persecuted and reviled for Jesus' sake to rejoice and leap for joy? For great, great is your reward in heaven. Same thing. God in his kindness exceeding in blessing what his servants have suffered and lost in the course of his service, in the course of their Christian lives. And then these great statements of the Apostle Paul that almost take our breath away. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 17, where he speaks about our light and momentary troubles and how they are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And then Romans 8, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. What have we been given? We've been given glimpses of our Father's heart, how he feels for his afflicted children, and what pleasure it gives to him, both in this life and especially in the life to come, to bless them in ways that far exceed what they have suffered and lost. So we thought about who is to receive the blessing, these two boys who, first of all, become Jacob's adopted sons. Secondly, our attention is drawn to the God who is to bestow the blessing. Verses 8 and 9. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, They are my sons whom God has given me here. And he said, Bring them to me, please, that I may bless them verses 15 and 16. And he blessed Joseph and said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. Now you see how he speaks of the God who is to bestow the blessing. He gives this threefold description, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. And you might suppose that when we come into verse 16, we have taken a step down, as it were, in terms of the source of the blessing from God to an angel. But that is not the case. This angel who redeemed Jacob from all evil or all harm and whose blessing is invoked here is the angel of whom we read so frequently in these Old Testament scriptures. This is the angel of the Lord. We find him appearing and speaking again and again and again. And as we do so, we're confronted with this remarkable combination, speaking and acting both on behalf of the Lord and as the Lord. It's one of the Old Testament foreshadowings of the Trinity, of plurality in God the angel of the Lord comes out from God and speaks for God and to that extent is distinct from God. And yet, as you listen to what he says, he is evidently, at one and the same time, identifying himself as God. How can you explain that? Well, there is only one explanation that will do justice to it. And it's the kind of explanation that is encapsulated in that magnificent opening statement of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was himself 
God. With God. Himself God. God with God. So here, the angel of the Lord, God with God. That's why in the New International Version and in the New King James Version, angel is capitalized. And I wish that it had been capitalized here in the ESV, for it ought to have been, for this is the angel of the Lord. This enters into the description of the God who is to bestow the blessing. Notice it again. The God before whom Jacob's fathers had walked. The God who had been Jacob's shepherd all the days of his life. The angel who had redeemed him from all evil, from all harm. There's a whole sermon in that description. Suffice it for us this evening to notice what this threefold description has in common. These are all pictures of a God who is near. We're to think about Jacob, the grandfather, invoking on his grandchildren the blessing of the God who is near. Or Jacob, the father, invoking on his adopted sons the blessing of the God who is near. And that is what we who are parents wish for our children. It is what we who are grandparents want for our grandchildren. The blessing of the God who is near to his people. God is near to us. And we desire our children, our grandchildren, to know the very same God. All through our Christian lives, we have walked before him in his presence. We've always been in his presence. And all our Christian lives long, he has been our shepherd right to this very day. And he has been to us too, the angel who has redeemed us from evil, evil in the sense of harm, and especially the harm that has come to us on account of sin. The God of his people is such a beautiful thing. The God of his people, not some distant deity, some remote God who's far too busy doing other things to be concerned about the everyday affairs of his people. He is a God who is near to us. And we are always in his presence. His eyes are ever upon us and his ears are always open to our cries. He's the Lord, our shepherd. And what a beautiful commentary we have on that in Psalm 23. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters, restores my soul, makes me to walk in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, with me even as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death so that I need fear no evil. A caring God, a protecting God, a providing God, a redeeming God. There is nothing better that we parents can desire for our children. Nothing better that we grandparents can desire for our grandchildren than the blessing of the God who is near. Oh, that the God who is near to us would bless our children and grandchildren and bless them with the very same knowledge of himself, the same covenant bond, the same salvation with which he has blessed us. Thirdly, the blessing itself. Let's read verses 15 and 16 as a whole. And Jacob blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. And in them let my name be carried on, 
and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. There are two parts to the blessing. In them, first of all, let my name be carried on, and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. The idea, this is John Currid in his EP study commentary, the idea is that they should always be a part of the people of Israel. Although they have an Egyptian mother, they are to be of the covenanted people. And no small part of it at that. And let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Which they did. You can check this out at the beginning of the book of Numbers and much later on in the book of Numbers. At the time of the Exodus, these two tribes together, Ephraim and Manasseh, had more fighting men over 20 years of age than any of the other tribes, apart from Judah. And at the end of their wilderness wanderings, when the time came for them to enter into Canaan, the two of them together, this is the tribe of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh together, were numerically stronger than any of the other tribes, even Judah in terms of men over 20 capable of fighting. Now you stand back once again as we did a few moments back. Had Joseph's brothers had their way there would be no sons of Joseph, no Ephraim and Manasseh. But Joseph's brothers didn't get their way. It was God who got his way. And in fulfilment of his purposes, these two boys grow into a multitude. I wonder how many times that has been repeated in the history of the New Testament church. The smallest of beginnings in a particular place. And had Satan had his way, that small number would have been reduced to zero. And he certainly tried. But God had his hand upon this small group of people and years afterwards. They are a multitude. And if you want an example, I think of the church of, in China. How fragile it was in its early days and what efforts, what in violent endeavours were made by the evil one to snuff it out and into what a multitude the church in China has grown. So we thought about who is to receive the blessing. And we thought about the God who is to bestow the blessing, this God who is near. We thought about the blessing itself. They're going to be a part of the people ever afterwards and a huge part of that. And then one last thing for us to notice, and that is the Son who is to have priority in the blessing. The son who is to have priority, first place, if you like, in the blessing. Of the two boys, Manasseh is the older. And accordingly, Joseph moves Manasseh to Jacob's right hand so that he might have the proper priority when it comes to the blessing that Jacob is to bestow. And then Jacob does something that disturbs and displeases Joseph. He crosses his hands. And Joseph goes to switch them, thinking that it's his father's eyesight that's at fault. We're told in chapter 48 that Jacob was practically blind. But it wasn't his eyesight. Verses 18 to 20. 
And Joseph said to his father, Not this way, my father, since this one is the firstborn, put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce blessings, saying, God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. We're back to the sovereignty of God. Jacob himself, the younger of two brothers, and yet he is the one who falls heir to his father's blessing. Now, we know the story that Joseph, or that Jacob stole that blessing from his brother, but it was intended by God to be his right from the very word go. And now here it is with Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim is the younger of the two. And if there is to be any distinction in the blessing, one would suppose that it would be in favour of Manasseh. But instead, Jacob is moved by God through whom the blessing is coming to give the priority to Ephraim, the younger brother. His younger brother shall be greater than he. Both are blessed. Both are blessed greatly. But the priority, the first place, is given to the younger rather than the older. And that has often been the way of God since. I think of two men, any two men, it's happened over and over and over again. Two men laboring in the work of the gospel. And one is more experienced than the other. Or theologically sound than the other. Or more spiritually minded than the other. Or more knowledgeable than the other. Or more gifted than the other. Now, which of the two do you think is going to be more greatly used of the Lord? Well, you might say it's the one who is more experienced, the one who's more theologically sound, the one who's more spiritually minded, the one who's more knowledgeable, the one who is more gifted. Not necessarily so. The God who is sovereign has often ordained it, that it should be the other way around, that it's the one who is less experienced, or less theologically sound, or less spiritually minded, or less knowledgeable, or less gifted, who is actually the more greatly used in the work of the kingdom. And he has important ends to serve by that. Actually, the same important ends as we noted some weeks back when we were thinking about how in feasting us, Jesus gives more to some than he does to others. God always has important purposes to serve by that. And, and so, in this instance, to how it humbles men. The man who's conscious that he understands more, is more experienced, more gifted, more spiritually minded perhaps. And here is his brother, less so, and yet much more greatly used. How humbling is that? And what a test it constitutes. Am I going to be jealous of my brother? Am I going to look down on him? Am I going to find reasons why this has all happened that actually discredits him, undermines his usefulness in the eyes of others? Or am I going to thank God for him? 
and be encouraged that God is using him and actually thankful that he's using him so much even although he's using me a lot less. It's a test. It's a test. And it makes us thankful by, by God's grace because we're all in this together. We're all serving the same master, engaged in the same great work. And if one is blessed to do more, praise God. And yes, how that whole situation enriches us. We find ourselves dependent upon one another if the work of the kingdom is to be done. And it enriches us as we work together and we see how God uses this one more than he uses us. And the work of the kingdom goes forward and we are enriched as we see it in the right spirit and we are enriched as we see the fruits of it in the developing work of the kingdom. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we confess that such things expose the envy of our hearts. Forgive us, Lord, when we have bad feelings towards those whom we consider to be less gifted or knowledgeable or sound than ourselves, and yet who are being more greatly used. Forgive us, Lord, when we have said things to try and undermine their character, to belittle their achievements. Lord, we are in this together. You use these things to humble us, to test us. By your grace, we would be thankful for all our brothers. Thank you for those who can do so much more than we can, whom you are using so much more than you are using us. Because we are all in this together and we want to see the hallowing of your name and the coming of your kingdom on your will being done on earth. Use, Lord, these expressions of your sovereignty, we pray, to build the church and to sanctify us and to enable us to function as the beautiful body that you intend that we should be. Thank you for this rich passage of scripture. Thank you again for the privilege of making our way through a chapter that is so rich in teaching that is for today for us. Make it helpful to us over the long haul, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. I want to read as we close one of Keith Getty and Stuart Townend's hymns, O Church Arise. I've been thinking about the church tonight. O Church Arise and put your armour on. Hear the call of Christ our Captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, they will stand against the devil's lies an army bold, whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor. And with a sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor. When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure. And Christ will have the prize for which he died, an inheritance of nations. Come, see the cross where love and mercy meet. As the Son of God is stricken, then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet, for the conqueror has risen. And as the stone is rolled away, and Christ emerges from the grave, this victory march continues the day every eye and heart shall see him. 
So, Spirit, come. Put strength in every stride. Give grace for every hurdle, that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful. As saints of old still line the way, retelling triumphs of his grace, we hear their calls and hunger for the day when with Christ we stand in glory. Loved ones, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen.